Marie Anne Charlotte de Corday d'Armont, the 27th of July 1768 to the 17th of July 1793, known as Charlotte Corday (French: Cade), was a figure of the French Revolution. In 1793, she was executed by guillotine for the assassination of Jacobin leader Jean-Paul Marat, who was in part responsible for the more radical course the revolution had taken through his role as a politician and journalist. Marat had played a substantial role in the political purge of the Girondins, with whom Corday sympathized. His murder was depicted in the painting The Death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David, which shows Marat's dead body after Corday had stabbed him in his medicinal bath. In 1847, writer Alphonse de Lamartine gave Corday the posthumous nickname Lange de l'Assassinat the Angel of Assassination. Biography Born in saint saturnin des ligneries a hamlet in the commune of Acorches in Normandy, Charlotte Corday was a member of a minor aristocratic family. She was a fifth-generation matrilineal descendant of the dramatist Pierre Cornet. Her parents were cousins, while Corday was a young girl, her older sister and their mother, Charlotte Marie Jacqueline Gaultier de Mesneville, died. Her father, Jacques Francois de Corday, Seigneur d'Armont, unable to cope with his grief over their death, sent Corday and her younger sister to the Abbey Aux Dames convent in Caen, where she had access to the Abbey's library and first encountered the writings of Plutarch, Rousseau, and Voltaire. After 1791, she lived in Caen with her cousin, Madame Le Coustelier de Bretville Gouville. The two developed a close relationship, and Corday was the sole heir to her cousin's estate. Corday's physical appearance is described on her passport as 5 feet and 1 inch. Hair and eyebrows auburn, eyes gray, forehead high, mouth medium size, chin dimpled, and an oval face. Political influence After the revolution radicalized further and headed towards terror, Charlotte Corday began to sympathize with the Girondins. She admired their speeches and grew fond of many of the Girondist groups whom she met while living in Caen. She respected the political principles of the Girondins and came to align herself with their thinking. She regarded them as a movement that would ultimately save France. The Gironde represented a more moderate approach to the revolution and they, like Corday, were skeptical about the direction the revolution was taking. They opposed the Montagnards, who advocated a more radical approach to the revolution, which included the extreme idea that the only way the revolution would survive invasion and civil war was through terrorizing and executing those opposed to it. The opposition to this radical thinking, coupled with the influence of the Gironde, ultimately led Corday to carry out her plan to murder the most radical of them all, Jean-Paul Merritt. Corday's action aided in restructuring the private versus public role of the woman in society at the time. The idea of women as second class or less than was challenged, and Corday was considered a hero to those who were against the teachings of merit. There have been suggestions that her act incited the banning of women's political clubs, and the executions of female activists such as the Girondist Madame Roland. The influence of Girondin ideas on Corday is evident in her words at her trial. I knew that he merit was perverting France. I have killed one man to save a hundred thousand. As the revolution progressed, the Girondins had become progressively more opposed to the radical, violent propositions of the Montagnards such as Merritt and Robespierre. Corday's notion that she was saving a hundred thousand lives echoes this Girondin sentiment as they attempted to slow the revolution and reverse the violence that had escalated since the September massacres of 1792. <laughs> Merritt's assassination. Jean-Paul Merritt was a member of the radical Jacobin faction that had a leading role during the Reign of Terror. As a journalist, he exerted power and influence through his newspaper, L'Ami du Pupil, the friend of the people. Corday's decision to kill Merritt was stimulated not only by her revulsion at the September massacres, for which she held Merritt responsible, but by her fear of an all-out civil war. She believed that Merritt was threatening the Republic, and that his death would end violence throughout the nation. She also believed that King Louis XVI should not have been executed. 
Corday believed in a structure like that of ancient Greece or Rome, the realization of which was made unlikely by the efforts of merit. On the 9th of July 1793, Corday left her cousin, carrying a copy of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, and went to Paris, where she took a room at the Hotel de Providence. She bought a kitchen knife with a six-inch (15 centimeters) blade. During the next few days, she wrote her address aux Français Amos de Lois et de la Paix, address to the French people, friends of law and peace to explain her motives for assassinating Merritt. Corday initially planned to assassinate Merritt in front of the entire national convention. She intended to make an example out of him, but upon arriving in Paris she discovered that Merritt no longer attended meetings because his health was deteriorating due to a skin disorder perhaps dermatitis herpetiformis. She was then forced to change her plan. She went to Merritt's home before noon on 13 July, claiming to have knowledge of a planned Girondist uprising in Caen. She was turned away by Catherine Everard, the sister of his fiancée Simone. On her return that evening, Merritt admitted her. At the time, he conducted most of his affairs from a bathtub because of his skin condition. Merritt wrote down the names of the Girondists that she gave to him, and she then pulled out the knife and plunged it into his chest. He called out, I des moi, ma chère Amy. Help me, my dear friend and then died, this is the moment memorialized by Jacques Louis David's painting. The iconic pose of Merritt dead in his bath is viewed from a different angle in Baudry's painting of 1860 illustration, below. In response to Merritt's dying shout, Simone Everard rushed into the room. She was joined by a distributor of his newspaper, who seized Corday. Two neighbors, a military surgeon and a dentist, attempted to revive Merritt. Republican officials arrived to interrogate Corday and to calm a hysterical crowd who appeared ready to lynch her. Topic: <inaudible> Trial. <inaudible> Charlotte Corday sent the following farewell letter to her father which was intercepted and read during the trial. The letter helping to establish that merit murder was premeditated. Pardonnez moi, mon cher papa, devoir disposer de mon existence sans votre permission. Je venge bien de victimes, je prévenu bien d'autres désastres. Le pupil, un jour désabusé, se rejoura d'être délivré d'une tyran. Si je cherche à vous persuader que je passe en Angleterre, se que j'espère garder l'incognito, mais je n'ai reconnu l'impossibilité. J'espère que vous ne serez point tormenté. En tout cas, je crois que vous auriez des défenseurs à con. J'ai pris pour défenseur Gustave Dulcet, un tel attentat ne permet nul défense, c'est pour la forme. Adieu, mon cher papa, je vous prie de m'oublier, au plutôt de vous réjouir de mon sort, la cause en est belle. J'embrasse ma sœur que j'aime de tout mon cœur, ainsi que tous mes parents. N'oubliez pas ce si vers de cornet. Le crime fait la hante, et non pas l'échafaud. Se demain a wheat hers, con me juge. Ce 16 gilet. Forgive me, my dear father, for having ended my existence without your permission. I avenged many innocent victims, I prevented many other disasters. The people, when they become disillusioned some day, will rejoice to be rid of a tyrant. If I sought to persuade you that I was leaving for England, it's because I hope to remain incognito, but I have recognized its impossibility. I hope that you will not be tormented. In any case, I believe that you will have defenders in Khan. I took Gustav Dulcet as my defender, a case like this permits no defense, so it is just a formality. Farewell my dear father, I beg you to forget me, or rather to rejoice at my fate, for the cause is beautiful. I embrace my sister, whom I love with all my heart, as well as my parents. Do not forget Cornet's verse. The crime causes the shame, and not the scaffold. The judgment is tomorrow at 8 o'clock. This July 16, Corday underwent three separate cross-examinations by senior revolutionary judicial officials, including the president of the Revolutionary Tribunal and the chief prosecutor. She stressed that she was a Republican and had been so even before the Revolution, citing the values of ancient Rome as an ideal model. The focus of the questioning was to establish whether she had been part of a wider Girondist conspiracy. Corday remained constant in insisting that I alone conceived the plan and executed it. She referred to Merritt as a hoarder and a monster who was respected only in Paris. 
She credited her fatal knifing of Merritt with one blow not to practicing in advance but to luck. Charlotte Corday asked for Gustave Le Doulcet, an old acquaintance, to defend her, but he did not receive in time the letter she wrote to him, so Claude Francois Chauveau Lagardy was appointed instead to assist her during the trial. It is believed that Fauquier Tinville voluntarily delayed the letter, however, it is said that Corday thought that Le Doulcet refused to defend her and sent to him a last letter of reproach just before going to the scaffold. Execution Following her sentencing Corday asked the court if her portrait could be painted, purportedly to record her true self. She made her request pleading, "...since I still have a few moments to live, might I hope, citizens, that you will allow me to have myself painted." Given permission, she selected as the artist a National Guard officer, Jean-Jacques Hauer, who had already begun sketching her from the gallery of the courtroom. Howard's likeness see above was completed shortly before Corday was summoned to the tumbrel, after she had viewed it and suggested a few changes. On 17 July 1793, four days after Merritt was killed, Corday was executed by the guillotine in the Place de Grieve wearing the red overblouse denoting a condemned traitor who had assassinated a representative of the people. Standing alone in the tumbrel amid a large and curious crowd she remained calm, although drenched by a sudden summer rainfall. Her corpse was disposed of in the Madeleine Cemetery. Aftermath After Corday's decapitation, a man named Legros lifted her head from the basket and slapped it on the cheek. Charles-Henri Sanson, the executioner, indignantly rejected published reports that Legros was one of his assistants. Sanson stated in his diary that Legros was in fact a carpenter who had been hired to make repairs to the guillotine. Witnesses report an expression of unequivocal indignation on her face when her cheek was slapped. The oft-repeated anecdote has served to suggest that victims of the guillotine may in fact retain consciousness for a short while, including by Albert Camus in his reflections on the guillotine. Charlotte Corday's severed head blushed, it is said, under the executioner's slap. This offense against a woman executed moments before was considered unacceptable and Legros was imprisoned for three months because of his outburst. Jacobin leaders had her body autopsied immediately after her death to see if she was a virgin. They believed there was a man sharing her bed and the assassination plans. To their dismay, she was found to be Virgo intacta, a virgin. The direct consequence of her crime were opposite to what she expected. The assassination did not stop the Jacobins or the terror, which intensified after the murder. Also Merritt became a martyr, a bust of him replaced a religious statue on the Rue Aux Ars and a number of place names were changed to incorporate his. Corday's act transformed the idea of what a woman was capable of, and to those who did not shun her for her act, she was a heroine. André Chénier, for example, wrote a poem in honor of Corday. This highlighted the masculinity possessed by Corday during the Revolution. The Revolution and Women Corday's act served as a turning point of views held of women during the revolutionary period. During the revolution women were given a newfound power resulting from the necessity of their being increasingly involved in the revolution. It is said that Corday's act served as a consolidation of a new system of gender relations during the revolution, because by entering into a new public sphere, she challenged gender norms of this time period. It is suggested that this newfound power resulting from women's taking revolutionary action, led to the death of some powerful women of this era, including Marie Antoinette, Olympe de Gouges, and Madame Roland. Corday's killing of such an influential leader during the revolution angered many people. Her actions were described by many as disquieting as well as transgressive. This behavior left a lasting impression on male revolutionaries because even though women were not at the forefront, they nonetheless had a place in the revolution, but not a prominent enough one to counteract a woman committing such an act. Her killing of merit was considered vile, an archetypically masculine statement, which reaction showed that whether or not one approved of what she did, it is clear that the murder of merit changed the political role and position of women during the French Revolution. Corday was surprised by the reaction of revolutionary women stating, As I was truly calm I suffered from the shouts of a few women. But to save your country means not noticing what it costs. 
After Corday murdered Merritt, the majority of women distanced themselves from her because they believed that what she had done would spark a reaction against the now developing feminist movement, which was already facing criticism. Also, many of these women were attached to Merritt in that they were supporters of his revolutionary efforts and sympathized with him as citizens of France. Cultural references American dramatist Sarah Pogson Smith memorialized Corday in her 1807 verse drama The Female Enthusiast, a tragedy in five acts. Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote about her in his posthumous Fragments of Margaret Nicholson 1810. Alphonse de Lamartine devoted to her a book of his Histoire des Girondins series 1847, in which he gave her this now famous nickname. Lange de l'Assassinat, the Angel of Assassination. French dramatist François Ponsard wrote a play, Charlotte Corday, that was premiered at the Théâtre Français in March 1850. In the 1862 novel Les Miserables, Combeferre likens Enjolras's execution of Le Cabuc to Corday's assassination of Merritt, calling it a liberating murder. Harper's Weekly mentioned Corday in their 29 April 1865 edition, in a series of articles analyzing the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, as the "...one assassin whom history mentions with toleration and even applause," but goes on to conclude that her assassination of Merritt was a mistake in that she became Merritt's victim rather than saving or helping his victims. At the end of Act Three, before departing to kill the Tsar, the eponymous heroine of Oscar Wilde's play Vera, or, The Nihilists 1880, exclaims, The spirit of Charlotte Corday has entered my soul now. In the 1903 novel Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, young Rebecca Ree enacts a scene of Charlotte Corday in prison, with her friends playing the role of the mob. Drew La Rochelle wrote a play in three acts called Charlotte Corday in 1939. It was performed in southern France during World War II. Corday is depicted as a fervent Republican who hopes eliminating merit will save the revolution and prevent it from degenerating into tyranny. In Peter Weiss's 1963 Merit, Chaudet, The Assassination of Merit is presented as a play, written by the Marquis de Sade, to be performed for the public by inmates of the asylum at Sheraton. Italian composer Lorenzo Ferrero composed an opera in three acts, Charlotte Corday, for the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution which was commemorated in 1989. Actor Herbert Lohm's 1993 novel Dr. Guillotine features Corday as a principal protagonist in a story set around the Reign of Terror. British singer-songwriter Al Stewart included a song co-written by Tori Amos about Corday on his album Famous Last Words 1993. Charlotte appears briefly but significantly, in Khan, in A Far Better Rest 2010, by Suzanne Allain, a reimagining of A Tale of Two Cities. The graphic novel series L'Ordre du Chaos includes a whole book dedicated to Charlotte Corday and Merit 2014. Corday is a central character in Lauren Gunderson's 2017 play The Revolutionists, a comedic quartet about four French women during the Reign of Terror. Gallery equals equals notes. <laughs>